Hello and welcome to Zombie Apocalypse Diaries 2.0. This would be episode of uh, the entry dated 19 June 2014. First entry of version 2.0 of Zombie Apocalypse Diaries. This is all be a brief introduction to the world of zombies as I have come to understand it. And I would like to try and convey to you my understanding in the hopes that you can start to grasp some of the concepts of what is going on in the world in a manner that I hope will explain things to you in a way that makes sense. So, what is Zombie Apocalypse Diaries all about? Well, I started to... Uh, I've been asking questions for all of my life. I was never part of my generation. My generation, uh, Generation X or previous generation of that, whatever, um, you know, just after the baby boomers, was uh, ostracized me from society. I was bullied. Uh, I was one of those kids. Well, rather than try and fight back or join in or whatever, I just, I just gave up and actually started asking, what is wrong with me that people are treating me this way? And, fast forward, let's see, that was, uh, that was how long ago? That was, um, sixth, fifth, fourth elementary school. So fast forward to 2012. I went to elementary school until 1981, by the way. So fast forward about, oh god, almost 40 years. Yeah. And I finally figured out what was causing people to treat me the way they were. And it all has to do with the fact that they're zombies. So bear with me. What a zombie is, and there's two kinds. What a zombie is, as I have discovered, and you will come to understand by watching this show. Zombie is no more than what psych uh, psychologists call a psychopath. Now, psychopath means they have a path. It's a short. It's short for pathological psychology, um, and that just means their brain's fucked up. It's pathological. It's diseased at the heart. It's fundamentally diseased. And what it is diseased with is a failure to acquire a very essential human trait called empathy. So these are the these are what I call primary zombies. They are the true psychopaths. They lack empathy. They exist and operate solely based on ego and in ego. Ego is the addictive aspect of our personality. It's the thing that has to always be right. And it is how our world has become shaped as it is. Because egos have decided that they want to be able to win. So they've created a world in which they can. Because winning is the opposite of cooperation, isn't it? You don't... If you don't... If you don't want to win a war or lose a war, you don't have one, right? How that works. Anyway, <laughs> no, forgive me. I'm going to try. I'm, I'm, this is this is new for me. This is version 2.0. Talking to the 20-somethings and the human beings out there. I'm done talking to zombies. They're they're stupid, and there's nothing I can do to convince them of how stupid they are. So I'm just going to talk to you and for you to assist me in saving humanity. So, what is empathy, by the way? And you'll, you'll have to forgive me, because I did suffer some brain damage, and it does affect my ability to keep track of my thoughts, for example. I do this while I'm driving primarily, because driving takes so little of my brain power, and I have all this time to think, and I do all this thinking, and coming up with uh, solutions, solving problems, you know, my brain's constantly working. It's a, it's a uh, uh, problem-solving machine, basically, and I can't turn it off. So, rather than be frustrated with it or stressed about it, I turn on this camera and I start recording to hopefully get some, uh, some information out there to you so you can help them, so you can understand what I've come to understand. Because my brain is, I don't know how it works, but it really does work really well, figuring things out like that. So anyway, and you'll have to forgive me, I do get uh, distracted occasionally because I am driving and I do have to be concerned about my safety. So... Excuse me. What is empathy and why is it a vital human trait? Well, before we 
started farming, before we started living cooperatively, before we started living in villages, we were individual human beings out there on the savannas hunting for our survival. Women were holed up in the caves, off on their own, probably living together like rather like uh, lions. And we were very much like lions, the male lion and the male uh, human back then, Neanderthal or whatever, proto-human, pre-human, was uh, very, very self-sufficient, or, or uh, not self-sufficient, self-centered, centered only on their own survival to the exclusion of everyone else. Sound familiar? Description of a psychopath? Because we were all psychopaths. But we watched um, pack animals, animals that hunted packs, social animals, and we saw that they were able to hunt and kill animals far greater in size than they ate, and far greater than they could possibly do on their own by cooperating. So at some point, a couple of really smart proto prehumans decided, hey, let's get together and hunt together. See what we can do. There's a problem here. How are they going to communicate? They didn't have language yet. We have to be cooperating to be able to, be able to develop language. We weren't cooperating, so we had no need for language. We had to be able to tell what the other person was thinking because we didn't have any way to externalize our thoughts. So we had to be able to quote unquote read each other's minds. And there is a possibility of doing that. It's something called, haha, guess what? Empathy. And empathy allowed us to sense what the other person was thinking through a recognition of, our, of the results of the expression of an emotion. So if you look at someone that's expressing fear, or hate, or anger, or love, you can tell what those emotions are, if you're empathetic. And a very empathetic person just automatically senses that other person's emotions, doesn't even have to think about it. So empathy allowed us to learn communication, because we had to communicate in order to cooperate. And there's something else that more that uh, empathy taught us. <laughs> Sorry, a little bit in there. This brain damage tripping me up. Uh, empathy taught us that if we do something, it showed us that if we do something to someone else, it affects them. So it taught us something called moral reasoning. Now, you're savvy with the internet, so go on to Wikipedia and look up Kohlberg's Moral Development. K-O-H-L-B-E-R-G. Kohlberg's Moral Development. And that explains very, very well, very concisely, moral reasoning. And read through that a couple of times until you understand that. Until you understand just what moral reasoning is and just how important it is. Note that uh, it's, at one point it mentions that democracy cannot function without moral reasoning, without uh, sufficient moral reasoning. And also notice in there that uh, the free conventional stages of moral reasoning, uh, law and order especially, and obedience, are what our system is. So our system encourages people to be pre-conventional more easily, but requires for it to function post-conventional. So in other words, our system is always doomed to fail because we don't have enough more reason. So I've touched on the other aspect of the show, which is the other zombie, which is the secondary zombie, which may be you to some extent. We're all secondarily zombies because we're all in taught by the zombie paradigm, let's call it. Uh, pardon the noise, I'm uh, obviously driving and I've got a trash truck next to me, which is extremely noisy. But you already know that. Uh, brain damage. Excuse me. So a secondary zombie, then, is someone who is influenced to not be empathetic, to not be cooperative, to be individualistic, to be self-centered by the zombie paradigm. And as a result, oops, pardon me, phone. Zombie Apocalypse Diaries, 19 June 2014, continued. Pardon the interruption there, I had a phone call from a friend, and I have, I have one of those now. You'll, uh, you'll get, you'll hear more about that later. But, uh, so, we've, 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 uh, gone over what a primary zombie is. We've gone over what a secondary zombie is. But how have they made the world the way it is? Well, we'll go over the history of psychopathy and zombies in the, uh, throughout human history. But basically, 
the uh, the short version is is that they took over. We put them in charge, basically, and they have shaped their our world to their needs. So ours is an egotistical human's world, not a mature human's world. So the, what is wrong with the world, what you sense is wrong, is very real. And it is no less than the zombie apocalypse. Excuse me while I go around a uh, vehicle on the shoulder. I drive with trucks and... Uh, to get better mileage. <laughs> so I'm in a little uh, 1987 three-cylinder Subaru Justy that gets about 35 miles a gallon while pulling this trailer behind me. That trailer. Sorry, press the wrong button. Uh, Zombie Apocalypse Diaries, 19 June 2014, continued again. Um, excuse me. Should have waited until I on just restarted. <laughs> anyway, I'm on a cell phone, so I uh, forgive me. I, uh, th this camera is a cell phone. And, uh, cellular Motorola pieces of shit, and uh, you know, it's not meant for human use, it's meant for zombie use. So anyway, so how have these zombies been able to create this egotistical world, this world where nobody likes each other, everyone's against each other, and all this? It's because that's how they are, and they believe themselves to be superior because they are, in some ways, well... They're one thing more than we are. They're fucking ruthless. They're more willing to resort to violence. They're more willing to resort to extremes, to torture, to, well, you know, all the things that our government's doing. <laughs> They're more willing to do all that. And they want a world that allows them to do anything they want, that allows them to exploit others, and allows them to say, well, we're superior and you're inferior. So all of you out there that get bullied, it's because you're human beings. And because we live in a world ruled by zombies, it is their world. The zombie apocalypse isn't happening. It's existed throughout human history. But the zombie apocalypse is now creating a global apocalypse. Because so we're at the threshold. I said, you're Generation Y. Generation Z, there are no more letters. That's it. It is no small coincidence that you are named Generation Y. You are the last best hope for humanity. Because you have a chance to recognize that their world is not a human's world. You have a chance to make a human's world. And here is how. This show will teach you. will show you. From there, you will have everything you need. If you need a leader, I'm willing to step up to the plate. I have no association, no loyalties to my generation. I fucking hate them. Universally, I have yet to find a single human being among them. My generation's gone to me. I have always been alone and consider myself to com be completely alone. In that, there are no people in my generation that I get along with. They aren't human. They're all zombies. And that's the other thing, is that you're young enough that you can still learn, you can still achieve your potential. And that's what moral reasoning is. We all have the potential to reason at Universal Ethics. I want you to look into potential. I want you to think about potential and what it means. It means that what, what we are ultimately capable of being, and we are all ultimately capable of being what the best of us can be. We're all capable of being as intelligent as Albert Einstein. We're all capable of being as fast as Bolt Jensen. We're all capable of being as strong as Jack LaLanne, if you remember him. I don't know who's a strong man these days. I apologize. There's going to be a little bit of a cultural gap in trying to communicate with you. But most of you don't use, won't watch television anyway. So, and again, I've gotten distracted, so I apologize. Zombie Apocalypse Diaries, 19 June 2014. It's the fourth or so uh, segment of this entry. Um, continuing to talk about zombies and basically reintroducing the uh, the show to the new audience, uh, new, new target audience, I should say, excuse me. 
Um, so, we know what zombies are, I think. Uh, I hope we've uh, gone over that. Now let's talk about the world they've created versus the way the world should be. Well, I mentioned that uh, human, natural, mature, proper human beings uh, have empathy. Now, empathy means that we... Empathy, empathy has another side effect. Side, well, I, I mentioned uh, moral reasoning. So, if you remember moral reasoning. Well, in moral, with moral reasoning, you know, I mentioned that we have laws that discourage people being at um, higher levels of moral reasoning, more, more developed in their moral reasoning. So, moral reasoning is the internal mechanism by which we judge right or wrong. So, if we externalize that, it's no longer internal, and you have to look up everything. And if you have to look everything up, then you put morality in the hands of others because you have to have someone in charge of the laws, the, the codification of morality. And that is corruption. That is corruption because the human mind, the human brain, the human being is fully capable of determining right and wrong on their own. We just have to be taught how to determine it. If we're not taught and we're instead given a book or a reference or told that there's a bunch of laws we have to follow that we can just look up morality, and we don't bother learning it, so we don't go around knowing what we can or can't do. Or what we should or shouldn't do, I should say. So externalizing and codifying morality in the law is a really bad idea that discourages more reasoning. And the zombies have created this world that way. And as a result of them creating the world this way, they have more control over us. Because they get to, turn, to determine what is right and wrong, not us. We don't decide on our own what's right and wrong. And that, my friends, means we have absolutely no freedom. If we do not have self-determination, if we cannot ourselves judge right and wrong, then how can we be free? So one of the things that I like to say to character, like to character, the way one of the ways I like to characterize our society is to say we don't have freedom of choice; we have freedom to choose. And if you think about that, you'll recognize the truth of that: that we don't have true freedom. We don't have the ability in this nation to choose from an infinite number of choices to make our own choices up. We're given choices to choose from, and that ain't right because that means that. We are beholden to those who make the choices available to us. And what really does is make us slaves. And this is why we have secondary zombies, because the primary zombies are in charge. The secondary zombies want to be just like them. Everybody wants to be like the primary zombies, because they're what they're who in charge. They have all the power. Excuse me. Sorry. Anyway, I'm probably boring you to death at this point. Uh, Gosh, let's talk about how the world should be, huh? That sounds like fun. Let's talk about the world if you were in charge. So, politicians, don't need them. Money, don't need them. Law, don't need it. Rules and regulations, don't need them. We need education, that's it. So yes, a lot more school, but not really, not school because we're put through all these many years of school, and I do say it that way for a reason, we're put through all these many years of school, instead of being provided with the opportunity to educate ourselves. Wouldn't that be a better idea? Self-determination, determine how we want to educate ourselves, but given a palette of things, a palette of ideas, not a, not a selection of choices, but some general guides, some ideas of how to educate ourselves and what to educate ourselves with. The more the merrier, of course. But uh, what we do is we train people in, this, in America. We don't educate anybody, we train people. Education is seeking understanding. Understanding is, okay, so uh, let me try and put this in terms that you would understand. Okay, if you understand, um, uh, let's see. Uh, well, I go ahead. Uh, electronics. Go ahead. Yeah, I use uh, I use electronics as an example. I think we still. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to say. Excuse me. 
Um, so electronics, if you know electronics, you can read a circuit diagram, you know what the components are, you know what the components do, you can look at a circuit diagram and determine where a problem is and fix. Or you can even build. You know, you have a, a, a circuit diagram, a schematic, shows you what the components are and how they're connected, you can build your own. But if you understand electronics, you understand how the memory's components interact, the connections between the components, and all the possible connections, then you can build your own stereo, design and build your own stereo. You don't need to look at a circuit diagram. And the same goes for everything else. And the way I like to describe it is this, is uh, imagine that uh, knowledge of something, or knowledge or understanding of something is a photograph, a digital photograph. Well, your resolution is your intelligence and your wisdom, your, 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 your base knowledge, what you, what you basically understand. You know, do you understand physics, chemistry, photography, engineering disciplines, uh, sociology, psychology, physics, you name it. You know, those are, those are pixels. The more knowledge you have, the more education you have, or giving yourself, the more capable you are of knowing more of the details of the bigger picture. So you have these available pixels that you can fill with knowledge, and that knowledge then paints a picture, but you don't really see the picture because all you see are the dots. The picture is made up of dots, and that's knowledge. But the real image is the connection between the dots, is the interaction of the dots. And that is understanding. So when you have a, enough knowledge to fill the holes, to fill the pixels, and you understand, then you have a full and complete picture. Excuse me, I've got traffic here. Uh, sorry, I'm still tired. I only got four hours of sleep last night. My apologies. Um, so, when you fill the picture up, you know, if you have incorrect knowledge, it just distorts the image, but the rest of the image is okay. Especially if you understand. If you have understanding, and it's comprised partially of inaccurate knowledge, you just correct the inaccurate knowledge, and your understanding changes. The understanding changes very little, but it changes, and you can correct your understanding. But if you are based on knowledge only, and you don't understand the interactions, the interconnected connections, and if your knowledge is wrong, then you don't know the picture. It's the picture of a big black, massive black dot on a photograph. You don't know what's there, because the knowledge is incorrect. So that's how I like to draw the comparison. In, uh, and what's interesting about this is that's exactly how our brains work. We have brain cells, but what makes our brains work and more powerful are the connections between the cells. So our number of cells is the knowledge, and the connections between them is understanding. Quite cool how that works out. Anyway, I'm going to try and think of something more entertaining and come back and fill the uh, rest of this episode with something more fun. Okay, Zombie Apocalypse Diaries, 19 June 2014. Um, part 6 at this point. Um, talking about the world that zombies have created and what's wrong with it. Part of you. Uh, one of the things significant that they, uh, the zombies have done is created property ownership. Like I said, this goes back all the way. I mean, the first thing they did to us was create agriculture, artificial scarcity, and trying to feed us food that isn't food. So let's talk about property ownership first, and then we'll go back to uh, agriculture because it, uh, they are very connected. So. Why does anyone have the right to own property? I'm asking you. Go ahead. Think about that. Why does anyone have the right to buy property? Really give it some serious thought. If you think about it hard enough, you'll find that you can't answer it. So go ahead and pause this for a while and think about it for you know, five, ten minutes. Just, just think about it. Just think about property ownership. Should we be able to own property? Is it good? Is it bad? Under what circumstances could we? Could we at all? So go ahead and pause. 
Have you paused yet? Okay, if you haven't, go ahead and pause and come back. Alright, so I assume you've paused, or you're not going to, so... The answer is, no, no one has the right to own property, because it doesn't belong to anybody. It never has, it never will. It's part of the earth. It's not ours. It's not ours to take or give. So no one has the right to own property. They've just declared themselves capable of ownership of property. Because, well, you know, because they want it for themselves. And they take it. And they tell you that money is how they're able to do that. <laughs> but where does money come from? From them. Anyway. <laughs> I was just... No, that's kind of funny. I wonder, was Hitler really trying to kill off the, the, the zombies? You know, I mean, did he go way, 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 way too far? No. Nothing to do with any of that. So, what do we have the right to own? One thing and one thing only. Anything we create. You have every right to own something you create. Did we create the planet? Did we create the earth, the land, the water? Nope. So we don't have the right to own it. But if we utilize natural resources and our own labor, and we are entitled to those natural resources, we can create something and keep it for ourselves. So for me, I am on a ship. It's a it's actually a laminated ferro cement. Go ahead and look that up. Laminated ferro cement. Write it down now laminated furrow of cement, and then look it up later. But basically, my ship is made of earth. Steel cage, steel skeleton, and a uh, earthen shell. Cement. <coughs> so it is. it was created. I didn't create it myself. I hired somebody to create it. 1975, they started it. <coughs> Obviously, I didn't commission them to start building it, but I did pay the person who paid the person who paid the people to buy it, to build it. I traded my labor for their labor for the labor to make the boat and the resources. Well, the resources, I don't know that they were rightfully belong to the people who took them, but can't do much about it now. It's done, is done. If I were to do it again, I would make sure I had entitlement to the uh, wood, like, or the material. For example, I am going to go down to uh, South America at some point and harvest wood. It's an Ipe or Paudarco species. I'm going to harvest that for um, doing the interior of my yacht. But uh, I'm going to sustainably harvest it, you know, from the bottom of the lake or the rivers or whatnot, so that it's water cured, but also available, freely available. It's already dead, it's already cured. There's no harm to the planet. Significant harm to the planet. There will be some slight, minuscule, unmeasurable amount because I'll be bringing it up out of the water and cutting it. There'll be energy use, waste material. So, um, so no, we don't have the right to own the property. We don't have the right to own land. Period. We can own a ship if we create it. We can own a house, but can we own the land it's on? That's a question. Well, I don't think so. Does that mean that we can? Does it mean that we can't have exclusive use of land? Oh, absolutely not. It just means we can't own it. We should have exclusive use. You know, I should be able to park on the side of the road here and walk off, and, and, and you know, no one's using it. Just camp out and whatnot. There's no problem with that. That's the way it should be. It really is. You should have every right to any piece of land as long as it's not being used. I mean, that doesn't mean you can destroy it and whatnot, but you can make good use of it. So what about food? So we, we created agriculture, and what that did was it created artificial scarcity. We created a shortage of food by growing it. How funny is that? Because by growing food, we become dependent upon it can't just go out and harvest it ourselves in the wild. Think about it. How often do you find yourself hungry and wander out to the woods and find a snack to fulfill your, to satisfy your hunger? <clears throat> you don't. 
<clears throat> we haven't for thousands of years. Most of us. Um, industrialized. Okay, so hundreds of years for industrialized society. So agriculture created artificial scarcity. We also created something that wasn't even food. I mean, we were eating stuff that, sure, we can eat it and it won't kill us immediately. But was it nutritious? Is it good for us? Does it satisfy our actual physiological need for food? The answer is irrefutably no. Most of it is not. Nine, almost everything agricultural, almost everything that is grown agriculturally is not suitable for human consumption. I know this because I have toxic syndrome, because of black mold toxin sensitivity, my immune system is saturated, and I have food allergies. I cannot eat any foods that have any kind of toxin in them. And that means I can only eat two vegetables that I'm aware of. Onions and garlic. The only other thing I can eat is fruit, and only fruit that is meant to be harvested because nature wrapped it up in a sweet filled sweet wrapped the seeds up in a sweet flesh covered with a protective shell like an apple or an orange or a nectar fruit or any of those any of a number of other fruits are all fruits edible by humans oh hell no berries should be avoided because they're riparian species and therefore pick up a lot of toxins if there are toxins around especially in the water especially these days Citrus is susceptible to it, so I would really avoid fruit from Central California. Because um, I discovered that uh, citrus pectin, the, the white part of an orange or lemon or any citrus fruit, is very, very good substrate for black mold <coughs> and many other molds. So it picks up toxins pretty easily. Um, oh god, I lost track. Ay, ay, ay. I'll come back. Yeah, so uh, food. Anyway, um, so I eat oranges primarily. Sometimes I'll eat a banana. They're a little bit too sweet. They got a little bit too much sugar and not much, not much other nutrients. But vegetables, not good for you. You know, you're told that you need a low-fat, high-fiber diet. <clears throat> that you should eat breads and you should eat dairy products and all that stuff. No, the only things you should be eating are fat, protein, vitamins, minerals. That's it. Some supplementation of, uh, you know, vitamins and minerals. That's why I eat onions and garlic. Onions and garlic. Onions are, uh, actually, onions are medicinal. Uh, and I do use seasonings when they are medicinal in nature. Uh, like, uh, one of the nutrients I'm going to, uh, one of the supplements I'm going to be putting to my food soon is, believe it or not, ground up hair. Because I have a genetic, another genetic issue where my hair doesn't grow. And that's why I'm out baldy here. Um... And that, I believe, is just that my body doesn't produce the uh, precursors to the proteins that make up our hair. Okay? So I think I have to consume that. So I'm going to try consuming ground hair for, actually, for my dogs. Conveniently available. And see if it works. But, uh, so, onions I use as medicinal for um, thinning my mucus. Uh, so if you ever have a cold... Don't eat sugar, eat onions. It thins your mucus, it motivates, it uh, mobilizes your mucus and allows it to clear out the uh, contaminants in your lungs, which is why you pack up loogies and cough. Um, garlic is an excellent source of uh, other uh, medicinal uh, um, properties, but also a great source of calcium and magnesium. Uh, calcium, possibly magnesium, but, I will, but I'm sure calcium. And it's a really good flavor. <laughs> I mean, wow. Um, so, I eat meat. Sometimes I will eat corn, treated with lime, the calcium carbonate on the fruit. Um, though sometimes I will put lime in the fruit over it. Um, I had been eating polished white rice, but I'm, I'm basically off that. I have very, very rarely occasion, on very, very rare occasions I will eat some. Um, and that's because uh, greens are bad for us. They contain phytic acid, which chelates our macro minerals, and uh, magnesium, calcium, and uh, uh, potassium. Um, let's see. Most, uh, almost all your vegetables contain toxins, and they're just not nutritious. And the whole fat thing, 
Okay, so the reason we consume fiber is because it's rough and your body cannot handle rough, so it soaks it with liquid. It puts mucus all over it because it's an irritant. So fiber makes you regular only because it irritates your colon. <laughs> Not good, is it? No. So it, it absorbs the, the, uh, the, you know, the mucus coats it, and then that absorbs moisture, and then draws moisture out of your colon, and that makes your stool running, and makes you regular. But what you really need is fat. When you consume more fat than you can digest, the bile combines with it. But it doesn't digest because your body already has enough, so it just stays combined with the bile. Well, that absorbs, that attracts water. It's hydrophilic. It loves water. So it will absorb, uh, uh, pull a great deal of water out of your colon, out of your intestines, and mix it with the undigested fat. And that makes you very regular. So all you need is a high fat diet. If you're constipated, it means you're not needing enough fat. And if you got the runs and you're not sick, it's because you've been eating too much fat. So we have a nice feedback mechanism to know how much fat we're supposed to eat. And here's another guide for you. Our mouths produce an enzyme, which is a mechanism by which food is digested. So the enzyme that digests carbohydrates is in your mouth. And it's called amylase, and it's in your saliva. So that's about how much carbohydrates you can eat. Your stomach produces, because it has to digest in your mouth, because your stomach produces hydrochloric acid and pepsin. Pepsin, one of the, one of the first enzymes discovered, which is why it's not called peptase instead of pep, uh, that's why it's not called peptase, because ase is a uh, suffix on any word for a enzyme. So it's not called pep, peptase, as it should be, but pepsin is produced in your stomach to digest protein. Protease, I believe it's called, is the other, is the proper, proper word. I think, I don't know, forget my brain damage. So, and then your duodenum, that's the first part of your small intestine, it produces lipase. Lipids are fat cells, are fat molecules. So your, your, uh, your uh, duodenum produces the uh, enzyme for digesting fat. That's it. If you eat too much carbohydrates, it goes into your stomach and takes the place of and di is digested in the place of protein. Protein is harder to digest, so your carbohydrates will eat up the acid, and uh, you won't be, able, won't be able to digest your proteins. And you need protein because that's what your body's made of. Your body breaks down the protein, redistributes it, and puts it back up by uh, so you can synthesize protein. So you make protein for protein. What is fat? That is energy. Fat breaks down and eventually becomes glucose, which is energy. It's transported directly to your cells. Carbohydrates, incidental. You don't need them. They do quickly convert to sugars, and that can cause a lot of problems if you eat too much. And too much is like maybe, uh, like too much is probably more than a saltine a day. That's it. So. That's what we're supposed to be eating. It's all this other crap that we're eating. Here's the thing. The allergic reaction that we get from eating things that we're allergic to like that, from eating foods we're allergic to, is one of stimulation. So you get a stimulating, stimulant effect from eating foods you're allergic to. So it's like you're on drugs. And remember, the ego is very, very, it exists um, it lives, it thrives, excuse me, on addiction. The ego thrives on addiction. And so if you feed the ego food that's stimulating, you're getting the ego addicted to the food. So that's the reason why Americans are fat, including myself previously. Two, two and a half, three years ago, I was a fat fuck. I was, uh, 260 pounds. Now I'm, uh, whopping 165 at my natural ideal weight and gaining muscle mass. I mean, well, I can't quite see it here, but anyway. So, those are a couple of lies, a couple of things we've been told that aren't quite true. Kind of funny, though. So, more of that to come. Alright, it's 
Zombie Apocalypse Diaries, 19 June 2014, uh, part... I don't know now. Um, in Santa Barbara. So let's do a theme. Wealth. What is wealth? Well, true wealth is the ability to create. What we think of as wealth now, we think of as money. So if you have a lot of money, you can do a lot. You can create a lot because you can buy a lot of resources and labor to create. But without money, before money, how did we have <coughs> quote unquote wealth? I am wealth. Skills. So a person with a lot of skills was really wealthy because they could create a lot. A person with the skills that most people didn't have was very very highly sought after for those skills. They were wealthy. Well, what we have today is people with a lot of money, and they get that money by exploiting others. God damn, people stay off my fucking bumper when you fucking pass me, huh? Fuck, man. Stupid fucking zombies. Anyway. Um, so we have these people who exploit others for money, and they hoard it, and that's supposedly wealth. And what are they creating with it? Not a goddamn thing. Excuse me. Ah, oh, fuck the text message. They can fucking wait. complicated, this whole money thing. Um, so should the wealthy be wealthy? Should they have more money than we? In their world, yes. In the real world, absolutely not. The only way someone could be more wealthy is to have more skills. Well, guess what kind of skills these wealthy people today have? Come on. What skills got them all the money they've got? Nothing. Just opportunities and Connections and exploitation. It's the only way they make any money. The only way they have wealth is by exploiting others. Seriously. That's it. There is no other mechanism by which they gain that money. Yeah, there are a few who actually earned it by inventing something that was useful. Useful. But they're few and far between, and most of them are dead by now. The guy that invented the copier actually he died broke. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe created a lot of. Uh, po oh wait, no, he died broke too. Um, yeah, all the people that have actually created things to do good for the world, dead, gone, and forgotten. All we hear about are the Rothschilds and the Rock Rockefellers and the Warburgs and all these other fucks. Excuse me, that uh, just give us money <laughs> or take it from us. And. Uh, yeah. So, uh, if you take over the world, which you can, you just gotta find the right leader, I'll volunteer if you want, then uh, you can create the world the way you want it to, not the way the zombies have, and you can redefine wealth to its true definition. So, you go to school, or you get yourself educated, because remember, we're not training you anymore, we're gonna educate you, we're gonna provide a way for you to educate yourselves, and teach you un how to understand, how to seek understanding, rather than seeking knowledge, feeding you bullshit information you want to give. So you go out there and you get all these skills, and in addition to what you have, because you're already more skilled than any of the wealthy people. Then you recreate the world in your image, in the way you want it, the way it should be, and guess what? The wealthy? Bye-bye. They're up shit creek. It completely flips it around. They're going to be dependent upon us. <laughs> oh, wouldn't that be fun? Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm supposed to be doing humor and enjoyment stuff. I'm still boring as hell. Sorry. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I'm going to try some experiments and try and see if I can't get in touch with the, uh, with your, uh, you know, put my finger on the pulse of uh, your generation, so to speak. Just kind of get a feel for what you guys, what you think, what, what goes through your minds, and what will, uh, what you'll actually pay.
pay attention to besides good, solid, truthful knowledge. Anyway, off to go think some more. Hello, Zombie Apocalypse Diaries, 20 June 2014. Um, 2014. Um, this is actually probably a continuation of the 19th, but, uh, anyway, um, talking about my generation, I was kind of musing on, uh, or thinking on why they're so fucked up. And I just happened to, to remember, and, and, you know, I, I was, I had just smoked a bowl of medicine, and, uh, I was lapsing into some, something, and just, um, fell into the, uh, Beavis and Butthead, <laughs> dude, you said, whatever, and, uh, voice, and, uh, Realized I didn't I didn't participate in that kind of culture. I didn't watch South Park. I didn't watch um, Beavis and Butthead. I didn't watch MTV. I didn't have Atari. I didn't have any of that stuff. You know, part of it was because we weren't very privileged. Um, part of it was because we just we didn't want it, or the family didn't care for it, or the family didn't want to subject us to most of that because you know that was you know, evil. Whatever. And also because I had no fucking interest. But, uh, you know, I think that's what's really wrong with my generation. They wanted the quick quick and total satisfaction to be handed to them. They didn't want to create their own satisfaction. Um, and it, it got them lazy. You know, these, this is the iPhone generation. You know, that's the epitome of their technological development. My generation's proudest defining moment is a fucking iPhone. You know, the generation before that was putting a man on the moon. You know, the generation before that was starting the civil rights movement. Before that was the New Deal. You know, and the Great Depression. You know, before that was World War One. You know. I do kind of get lost when I am uh, medicated. But, uh, as you will, uh, see or have seen in the, uh, previous episodes, uh, I do mention that, uh, while I do lose track, it's the only mechanism by which I can come up with some of the things I come up with. I realize, you know, it allows your brain to focus because it shuts down a lot of other processes that get in the way. It relaxes you and um, just generally provides the opportunity to focus your thoughts. Um, it does have divination properties. Uh, Salvia is about the uh, most potent divination properties of any of the entheogens, entheogenic plants. Wow, I'm pretty much asleep right now. Wow. Yeah, we'll talk about uh, Dream States. Gosh, this is, this is so horribly boring. Uh, I'll figure this out. Be patient with me. Just think, if it's even slightly entertaining, it'll be tremendous compared to this crap, huh? See, I'm getting it. I'm getting it.